you're all on my list. I will harass you about events coming up that you can engage with. Professor Pisman. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to come down at the last minute because it's actually a pleasure to be here. Listening to all the things that are going on, I feel like uh, maybe I should actually move my residence down to, um, uh, down to Washington so I can participate. Uh, I'm not going to give you a pitch on someone's wine company uh, or otherwise, but I will actually give a brief description of the center that I run in Columbia. Um, partly because it's something that, you know, I, um, uh, I post-date Darren at Columbia, but not by that much. I've been there for uh, 11 years now. And uh, when I first arrived, social enterprise, which is a topic that I know is important to quite a number of people in this room, essentially didn't exist at Columbia Business School, or did not exist on anything close to the scale that it exists today. Uh, there was a nonprofit management program which began in the mid 80s. Uh, now, um, you know, a lot of people are surprised and uh, amazed and surprised by this number. Uh, close to half of the students, 45% of the students, are very actively involved in social enterprise in one way or another, either through taking courses, because there's now a slate of over a dozen courses we offer that are very uh, squarely centered on uh, social enterprise or nonprofit board leadership program or one of the clubs that sit under the social enterprise umbrella. Uh, it's really been a transformative decade for uh, uh, social enterprise at Columbia Business School. So I would strongly encourage you, certainly if you're a Columbia Business School alum, um, to see what's up on our webpage. You'll see some of the recent events we've had. Um, uh, including you know, our uh, Research Meets Practice series, which we'd be happy to entertain uh, the possibility of extending it southward now and again, much as we will extend it westward once a year uh, to the Bay Area. Uh, there's a lot going on, and uh, uh, I... Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a reminder to turn off your phone. Um, my phone is on because if my phone rings, it's my wife telling telling me she's gone into labor. So I'll make it. Uh, I'll make a quick exit. Um, uh, I uh, take the time to uh, describe this to you because uh, so much of this really is recent. So even relatively recent alums, uh, you know, it's a different it's a different place in this regard. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about tonight, I, mean, I describe my own work as half why do people do bad things and half and increasingly why do people do good things like the, they are the yin and the yang of my existence. Uh, I've been doing a lot more work on corporate citizenship which I probably will not get to tonight. Um, but what I want to do essentially is just tell a few stories. Um, stories uh, grounded or that came out of work that I've done as well as work that I've done with my friend and colleague, uh, Edward Miguel. Um, and these are stories about bad things that people have done, venal, self-serving acts. But if I do a good job of telling these stories, which I hope I will, uh, then you're going to walk out of here not thinking that these are bad people, but that these are bad things that were enabled by a set of circumstances uh, interacting in an unfortunate way with human nature. Now, uh, implicit in this, there's going to be some psychology mixed in with economics here. I'm an economist by training, uh, but for better or worse, I've been an interloper in psychology over the years. And I think if you study corruption, you really have to think about um, uh, these two sides to, to human behavior, the rational and the emotional and impulsive. <coughs> Uh, so there'll, there'll be elements of each, um, uh, elements of each in uh, these stories. Uh, but overall, the message that I'm going to try to convey to you is nothing like a grand unified uh, theory of human behavior, or why people do bad things, but rather uh, a couple of hints about what have led people astray. Uh, again, this is more of the form of narrative and storytelling but also um, some sense of what we might do about it. So uh, we learn something about the problem and that gives us some hint uh, as to solutions. Now I'm going to uh, start 
with a story. We'll get back to um, uh, our home country soon enough, and I'm sure we'll get back at some point to um, embezzling CEOs and such, <laughs> uh, which we know are not a thing of the past. But I'm going to start instead with a story about uh, the poorest district, Mautu, in one of the poorest countries, Tanzania, in what is by far the poorest continent on the planet. Um, now, uh, for all I know, Mautu does have embezzling CEOs, but what they do have, uh, certainly, is a problem with witch killing. Uh, so in fact, in the last couple of years, there's been a spike in witch killing in Mautu. There's actually been a spike in witch killing uh, throughout Kenya, Tanzania, the two countries we've been following. Now, it probably surprises at least some of you to know that witch killing is alive and well uh, in much of the world. This is not a Tanzanian Kenyan phenomenon. There are witch killings globally in Asia and Latin America as well. It is a common thread to many cultures. Um, now, it's instructive to learn a little bit about who these witches are, why people might target them in this way. Um, so who are these witches, these people who are um, targeted by their communities for punishment? Uh, true to stereotype, the witches, witches of Mayatu are generally old women. Um, they are generally persecuted for, um, as punishment for some misfortune. Um, most commonly, uh, witches are targeted because the rains have failed, the crops have failed, uh, though it's certainly not unheard of from what we're told for witches to suffer because someone fails their exams. Imagine you fail your exams, you track down a witch and she takes the blame for it. People lose their jobs, you blame the witch. Now, again, allowing psychology to enter the picture, uh, I don't think you need a PhD in anything to have the sense that you know, it's human nature to look for a scapegoat. We all have this craving. Uh, you blame your wife. You blame your parents. You blame your dog. Uh, I like to blame my mother-in-law, and I don't think that that's uh, an entirely unusual human compulsion. Uh, in this case, the witch takes the blame. Um, now the circumstances for my mother-in-law are nothing compared to what the, the witches of Mad to experience. Uh, the most common punishment for uh, those accused of witchcraft, and by the way, witchcraft is most commonly a very intimate crime in the sense that uh, it's somewhere in my immediate family. Uh, so my mother, my aunt, my grandmother. Uh, these people are most often killed. Uh, and if they're not killed, because you have to put an end to the sorcery that's causing you all these problems. So you either run her out of town, or you put an end to her entirely. Uh, and it is generally women, uh, in this case and in many instances. Some of you may have read about uh, child witches in East Africa um, and the uh, increase in child abandonment um, uh, with uh, uh, witchcraft is the rationale given, uh, and we'll see, it's a, it, it is actually a fairly, in many ways, it's a similar phenomenon. Um, so now to summarize, because I've meandered a little bit, um, what's going on in Meatu is bad things happen, which objectively speaking are no fault of some old woman. Someone uh, hacks them to death with a machete uh, under the delusion that that's going to make things better. Now this does not sound like a problem that necessarily is best handled by a pair of economists. Uh, this sounds like an anachronistic set of beliefs, again, scapegoating, lashing out. Uh, and there will be that, that element to it as well. Um, but what I'm going to argue um, throughout the evening is not that, um, oh, it's all psychology, it's all economics. And I think one, uh, one difficulty um, uh, or per perhaps the primary difficulty is figuring out which of these is to blame for uh, primarily for whatever phenomenon you're observing. So I'll argue that at the heart of it, witch killing in Meatu is not at all cultural in the sense that uh, it's a cultural excuse or rather a psychological excuse for what is 
an underlying economic imperative. So recall that the witches get killed when bad things happen. They get killed when bad things happen for the community as a whole or for the individual family unit. So now this is the poorest region in the poorest country on the poorest continent on the planet. So these are people who even in good years are bumping up against the constraints of survival. You now give them a negative shock. So you have just enough calories to survive. Now you have 10% less for your family overall. So what are you going to do about that? Well, one obvious solution presents itself. Um, instead of getting rid of one family member, we just each eat 90% less, less. But you're on the edge of survival to begin with. So 90% of survival is not um, you know, near survival. It's certain death for everyone. Because there's a caloric threshold that human beings can drop below. Um, might seem fair to draw straws. That has some egalitarian appeal to it. But if you imagine yourself as a social planner, um, picking the fittest, I'm reluctant to use these evolutionary terms, but they seem to work well for this context, picking the fittest response of the family, you would want to get rid of the family member for whom the gap between consumption and production is greatest. So that is an elderly person. Uh, it has the added plus that they can't really fight back. 